one innovation at a time. Now, necessity may be the mother of invention, but in today's world, she's a pretty fraught mum, trying to deal with thousands of kids tugging at her skirts, pulling at her arms, wrapping themselves around her legs, all of them screaming out for attention. Now, we're not short of challenges which affect the very basics of trying to live our lives in today's world. Getting enough to eat, clean water to drink, a roof over our heads, and some peace to allow us to sleep at night. It might look neat and tidy to package these up into something like the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals. But we shouldn't forget that beneath those critical targets for change lie thousands of things that need improving. And we keep coming up with new ways of going down. Nature can be pretty hostile with its round of earthquakes, floods, devastating storms and droughts, but we've become adept at adding to the misery with our own man-made disasters. In the face of all this, we need to be bold, be revolutionary and disrupt, because without innovation, there is no way we can overcome the challenges of our times. These are wise words and they give us an urgent call to action and they come from Antonio Guterres, who's the Secretary General of the United Nations. And of course, he's not alone. The case for social innovation on a global scale is clearly made every time you open a newspaper or scan a website. The question isn't one of whether or not we need innovation, but how, how to deliver it. Now, fortunately, we're making some progress along that road learning to innovate and to do so more effectively. Thankfully, there have always been people who tried to respond to the challenges posed by natural or man-made humanitarian disasters and our unequal development. Innovations always happened, and social entrepreneurs are not a new thing. Think of Albert Schweitzer, Florence Nightingale, Clara Barton, Washington Carver, George Cadbury, countless others who've worked to create change for good. But what has changed is a growing recognition of the need not just to respond, but to learn lessons about how to do so effectively. How to master the capabilities around being able to repeat the innovation trick. Anyone might get lucky once, but how can we keep on doing so? Just like a commercial company able to churn out a steady stream of new products, we need the ability to keep innovating and to learn to manage the process more effectively. Now, the challenge of innovating is what it always was. How do we create value from ideas? It's not a light bulb moment. There's no instantaneous flash and suddenly the newborn innovation is there, ready to change the world. No, instead, it's a journey through some pretty uncertain territory towards realising the value in our idea. If we're serious about using innovation to create social value, then we need to learn how to make that journey and to do so regularly. Now, studies of innovation management point to the idea of routines, patterns of behaviour which are learned and repeated, becoming embedded in processes and structures. They're the the way we do things around here in our organisations. How do we search for opportunities? How do we select and and prioritise those projects so we don't waste our scarce resources? How can we grow our idea through careful prototyping, agile innovation, learning as we go and pivoting towards something which will work. And the good news is we now know a lot about routines for successful innovation. We've been studying this, learning from research and mostly from hard-won experience about what works and what doesn't for well over a hundred years. We can write books about it, teach courses on it, build a huge management consulting industry around it. There's a body of knowledge which is growing and it contains key information about what we might call the DNA of successful innovation. We've reached a point where the International Standards Organization have given us a guide framework for how innovation ought to be managed. Not as a single activity, but as an integrated system 
enabled by key routines which evolve and which are adapted for a particular organisation. It's absolutely not a case of one size fits all, but there are guidelines, genes if you like, which code for success in different parts of the system and which ensure a healthy innovation process. Now, these are lessons which smart organisations have always known, but only because they've been paying attention, reflecting on how they innovate and adapting and extending their routines into policies, processes and structures. Successful players, members of what you could call the 100 Club, that's organisations which have lifespans in excess of 100 years, those organisations don't get there by accident. Facing a world of uncertainty and sometimes violent change, they've learned to innovate as a way of surviving and growing. Companies like 3M, Corning, Procter & Gamble, Rolls-Royce, they've got clear maps of their own around how to organise and manage innovation. And they're not afraid to revise, sometimes dramatically, as they confront new environments. Well, the good news is that this kind of systematic approach is increasingly being used in the service of social innovation. For example, we've learned a lot about how to help startups grow their bright ideas through careful support and incubation. There are innumerable boot camps and other structures which can and do help. We can use hackathons to focus ideas and energy on finding novel ways of dealing with key challenges. And we can train key entrepreneurial skills around building and populating business models to give shape and structure, creating an architecture through which ideas can create value. And these models have diffused widely in the social innovation space. For example, many agencies of the United Nations have long running programs which draw potential innovators together and help them with funding, advice, mentoring. Take the World Food Programme, for example, which tries to work to ensure that in a world of plenty, hunger should be a thing of the past. And it's helping deliver on this mission, and it employs around 23,000 people in 120 countries, but it's putting innovation right at the heart of its approach, ensuring millions of people, often in vulnerable and conflict-torn situations, are fed isn't an easy task and requires mobilising ingenuity at every turn. Now, WFP have a long-running commitment to innovation, formalised in its Innovation Accelerator, which has been operating since 2015 and which uses multiple mechanisms to find and support innovators throughout the journey from idea to effective impact. In 2022 alone, over 37 million people benefited from innovations coming through this route. Examples include hunger mapping tools to pinpoint where aid is needed, blockchain solutions to enable secure transactions and deliver aid which increasingly takes the form of cash transfers rather than simple food delivery, helping people help themselves, and drone delivery to remote and inaccessible locations, or hydroponic solutions which allow otherwise inhospitable environments to support growing food, and deploying chatbots to enable communication between vulnerable people in crisis zones and those able to help meet their needs. The Share the Meal app offers a simple way of allowing consumers throughout the world to make a small donation to help alleviate hunger. It's essentially a focused crowdfunding approach, but by 2023, it had shared over, by 2023, it had shared meals from one and a half million app users, raising an estimated $30 million. Now, importantly, the WFP Accelerator provides a range of support to innovators, from early stage idea development, right through to working to help successful pilot programs move to significant scale. And it operates at the frontier of knowledge about effective ways to enable innovation in organisations. For example, it was recognised by Fast Company magazine in 2021 as one of the world's most innovative players in the not-for-profit sector. It's not alone. UNICEF, the United Nations agency dedicated to building a better world for children, has followed a similar path. 
It claims a 70 year history of innovating for children and its Office of Innovation was established to offer a variety of support routes and mechanisms to help attract and support innovators, helping them grow their ideas and increasingly move them to wide scale adoption where they can have significant impact. And their portfolio is equally wide, ranging from high technology like drones, artificial intelligence and a huge range of digital solutions, but also working with frugal innovation solutions geared to local contexts. Or the idea of innovation labs. Give them whatever name you like, but think about an environment which allows incubation and growth of ideas. This idea of innovation labs is widespread. Nowhere more so than in the United Nations Development Programme, which launched an ambitious network of 91 labs in 115 locations around the world trying to support innovators. Now, this has been running since 2019, and it's an attempt not just to provide local support in different countries, but to create a learning network where good ideas and practices can be shared and diffused around the world. It's enabled a wide range of people, many of them grassroots innovators, to articulate and develop their ideas into viable and valuable solutions. But it's not just spaces and facilities to encourage innovation. Increasingly, the role of innovation manager is being taken up to provide key skills and to enable the process. Organisations like the Humanitarian Innovation Fund employ people who are there as innovation managers to help deliver their innovation strategy, overseeing funding, selection, development of new programmes and delivery of established support, such as their Journey to Scale programme, now in its third iteration. And examples of the kind of projects they funded and which have now gone on to scale include work with Translators Without Borders, which aims to offer local language translation services during humanitarian response, or open street mapping to crowdsource the creation of maps in disaster zones where they're needed quickly, or work with the Red Cross to provide menstrual hygiene management kits that are culturally appropriate and effective relief items for emergencies. Now, organisations are becoming increasingly strategic in their innovation targeting, moving beyond provision of badly needed products and services as an offering. They're also focusing on internal processes and the development of external delivery ecosystems, and they're targeting particular markets, identified groups of vulnerable end users of innovation. For example, there's been a growing focus on the needs and the challenges of gender-based violence and on the educational needs of displaced persons. Support also exists in the form of learning resources. There's a growing number of tools and courses available to equip innovators with relevant skills and to do so in ways which deliver them online to help improve accessibility. Examples include the Humanitarian Innovation Guide, the Business Model Sustainability Toolkit, the United Nations Innovation Toolkit, and the Mission Model Canvas. Now, one of the well-established skill sets across aid agencies is their capabilities around monitoring and evaluation. Now, these systems are designed to allow transparency and accountability to various stakeholders, but they also represent powerful tools for capturing and sharing learning. And these tools have been adapted for the innovation space. So, for example, the Humanitarian Innovation Fund has used its monitoring and evaluation skills to review and reflect on success factors in delivering multiple innovation projects. The result was a report, More Than Just Luck, which provides a valuable platform for building and strengthening a systematic approach for the future. Now, this also highlights the value of communities of practice, groups of individuals and organisations which converge around shared interests. The power of such communities in accelerating innovation through experience sharing can be seen in the Cash Learning Partnership, which was originally set up in 2005 to try and develop ways of delivering aid via cash transfers using mobile phones, credit cards and so on. 
It's enabled a revolution in the delivery systems for aid agencies, getting important resources to people rapidly in the wake of many different kinds of emergency. Now, innovation involves a moving frontier. The context in which we are trying to create value is constantly changing. And there's a need for innovating organisations to build evolving systems taking on new challenges as the routines for the basics of innovation become established. A key thrust along this frontier is the challenge of scale. The humanitarian and development system has now got a healthy pipeline of new ideas and the channels to build those into pilot solutions which prove the concept in a particular context. What's missing is the next step, scaling those innovations to have real impact. This has spawned extensive research and the sharing of insights, summarised, for example, in a recent report delivered by United Nations Global Pulse. And once again, the role of communities of practice becomes important. IDEA, the International Development Innovation Alliance, brings together multiple players with a common interest around this scaling challenge, one which is also being addressed by the scaling group within the United Nations Innovation Network. Now, maturity in innovation management is measured in part by the ability to reflect critically and explore challenges in the organisation in terms of its structures and approaches. Nowhere is this more evident than around the challenge of ambidexterity, where the part of the organisation concerned with operations and delivery comes into conflict with the part concerned with exploring and pushing the frontiers. Innovation is central to both, but where the former requires incremental, do-what-we-do-better approaches, sometimes called exploit innovation, the latter, the exploration, requires doing something different, explore innovation. You need both, but the structures and cultures to enable them are very different. Now, all large and established organisations encounter this challenge, and many approaches have evolved around corporate entrepreneurship and other ways of rekindling the innovation spark from within. It's instructive to see bodies like the United Nations now openly identifying and working with this set of challenges. Now, we've got a long way to go, and the waves of crisis keep washing up against our beach. But we are learning to build more than sandcastles. We've begun to put in place structures and systems, and we've got growing resources in terms of skills and capabilities to help stem the tide. Mm -hmm.